about the creation. Uh, and, and I have wondered whether we need some different ways, some radically different ways to think about the creation. Uh, and one of the things which I've wondered about when we are talking about whether the design in nature is intelligent or not, and so much of this discussion orbits around the central idea of intelligent design. So much of it uh, is there. But all of this is driven by a prevailing but kind of unexamined metaphor that we should think about God as an engineer, and so we should bring engineering questions to creation and evaluate them as engineering projects. Now, when we go to understand God, as we know, God is so far beyond us that we can only have the most pale of understandings. So we reach for metaphors. And God can be a father, God can be a friend, God can be an engineer, uh, and so on. And we see throughout the scriptures, the Lord is my shepherd, and so on. There's, there's a lot of metaphorical language that we constantly use. But sometimes we can forget that we're using metaphors. And I think sometimes we forget when we're having discussions about the epiglottis, for example, uh, that maybe thinking of God as an engineer who would do things in our body the way the mechanics at General Motors do them in their car, that that might not necessarily be entirely adequate. Perhaps not a wrong metaphor, but something which we uh, shouldn't emphasize too much. Maybe there are uh, other metaphors. What if we thought about God as an artist, for example? And suppose that the prevailing metaphor for understanding God's work in creation was that of God as an artist. Now, this doesn't solve all the engineering problems, but it just causes you to not really look at them as engineering problems anymore. If you're looking at a piece of artwork, like you don't look at the piece of artwork and say, oh, too much paint, or something like that. I mean, that's not the way you would evaluate that. You might look at an engineering project and say, this is going to need too much material uh, there. But art is evaluated differently. But we don't spend much time, especially in our... Uh, lower Protestant traditions, uh, thinking about art and God as an artist and what it might mean to look at the natural world, not as a grand engineering project, but as a grand work of art. Now, if we do this, if we were to look at nature as something other than an engineering project and a work of art, I think we might start to ask some different questions. We might not see the world as uh, full of waste. We might begin to see the world uh, as, as creative and extravagant in its beauty. We might see it uh, not red in tooth and claw, as Tennyson said. I mean, think about, if you will, how extraordinarily beautiful almost every kind of natural scene is. I don't think we spend enough time thinking about what this means. I mean, why, why are these scenes so incredibly beautiful? Um, I, I'm, I'm mindful that this can kind of sound like a God of the Gaps kind of argument, but I, I don't think it is. Uh, but, I mean, why is it that we have an aesthetic sensibility that makes scenes like this so remarkably beautiful? I mean, the very, very different uh, settings, but yet they all have their great beauty. I mean, everybody from uh, eastern Canada and New England, and I see your leaves are starting to change here. I mean, this, this it's just gorgeous when the leaves change color uh, in the fall. But there's a stark beauty to a tree with no leaves against the barren landscape as well. I mean, nature is just interesting on so many levels. The coloring of creatures, the sound of the birds, the way the birds sing. I do a lot of work in my uh, sunroom at home and the birds sing outside the window and there's so many different kinds of birds all singing different songs but, but all of those little sounds together uh, are just magnificent. There's an interesting grandeur to snow-capped mountains. I mean, what, what's the origin of the awe we feel when we look at something like this? This is all a part of the created order. Here's this interesting kind of quasi-mathematical structure that we get when the wind uh, blows in just the right way. Again, very, very different than the water scenes, but still uh, incredibly beautiful. And why is it that children are so extraordinary? Anybody who's played with toddlers knows that there's just something about little children and the, and the sounds they make and so on as they begin to explore their world that just seems... Uh, seems to draw you. I have a, uh, a grandnephew about this age now, and, and when the family is together, I mean, he's the show. Okay? My uh, niece got uh, 
married recently and he occupied center stage at the reception and nobody paid any attention to the bride and the groom uh, because it was a little toddler uh, walking about. Uh, so there's all of this extraordinary beauty that's there in nature and, and I don't think we pay enough attention to that and ask the question, what, what does it mean that we can enjoy all of this beauty? Now, when we work towards thinking about a more constructive stance towards evolution, we're up against, I think, an almost insurmountable barrier, and that's that the word itself has come to mean so much that is terrible. I mean, evolution, if you ask the man on the street what evolution means, uh, if they can answer it all, they won't say, oh, it's a theory of biological evolution that shows how species evolve by natural selection. They'll say, oh, it's that uh, uh, godless belief that atheists have that uh, there's no purpose uh, to, uh, to human existence. Uh, some people uh, have actually suggested that evolution is satanic. Henry Morris in The Long War Against God uh, says that evolution originated uh, not with Charles Darwin, but with Satan. And in this, in this book here, which was very popular in the late 80s, uh, he makes the argument that Satan delivered the theory of evolution to Nimrod on the top of the Tower of Babel. And Nimrod brought it down from the top of the tower, spread it about to everybody that was working on the tower. And then when they were dispersed uh, in the confusion of tongues, the story spread throughout the globe. And that's why civilizations everywhere have a naturalistic uh, theory of origins. Now, if you believe this about evolution, well, of course, uh, you're not going to be able to uh, say, well, I can be a Christian and accept this uh, particular idea. Now, this is a very, very widespread idea. It's, it's so widespread that it showed up on The Simpsons. I mean, here's Charles Darwin making out with Satan, right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, you, you can't make parody of an idea which would be completely unfamiliar to its audience. And so uh, anybody who has followed this controversy at all knows that, that the connection drawn between Darwin and all manner of evil, including Satan himself, uh, is there and it's very real in the minds of many Americans. Uh, here's uh, Ken Ham in his museum, uh, not too far from here, that I uh, hope to visit uh, on Monday afternoon. Uh, in his book, The Lie, he puts evolution in apocalyptic terms. Uh, quoting uh, Peter in the New Testament, uh, he says, The Bible prophetically warns that in the last days, false teachers will introduce destructive lies among the people. Now, uh, this is a, a loose paraphrase of what's in the New Testament. doesn't say what these lies are in the New Testament, but Ken Ham will tell you what they are. The lie is here, and the lie is evolution. So when we're talking about trying to find new ways to discuss evolution, you can see that even the word itself has baggage and serious problems. Here's a very famous cartoon that Ham has uh, reproduced many times over the years that, that shows the way that he wants Christians to think about this problem in our culture. Uh, quoting the psalmist, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? So we have this battle here, and this is how he understands the creation-evolution battle. Uh, here we have the evolutionists, Truth comes from men who decide whatever they want, and presumably women as well. Uh, and here the evolutionists are all systematically working to dismantle the foundations of Christianity, which are creation. Okay? Not, not Christ, but uh, creation. Uh, the Christians, on the other hand, are very disorganized. This guy up here is sleeping. He's just firing off his cannon to hear the sound, I guess. This fellow here is actually shooting at a fellow Christian. This guy here is shooting at his own foundations. This guy here is actually doing something constructive. So he's blown up one of the evil fruits uh, of evolution. You know, reality TV or something uh, up there. Uh, <laughs> I've been blown up. Uh, but, but the problem... The problem with the Christian approach is that we're aiming at all of these things, which are the offspring of evolution, when all we need to do is destroy the foundation and this will all come tumbling down. And you can see how sturdy the evolutionary tower is here and how crumbling the Christian tower is. So his call, his clarion call, is for us to join him uh, and work on dismantling these foundations over here. Now, 